Hi, welcome to the video, Why Think Like a Physicist? The title of this video has two meanings. First, it's asking why this channel has the name it does. And second, it's asking why someone would want to think like a physicist. Let's get started. So we'll cover three broad topics. Things physicists are good at, why these skills are useful to non-physicists, and what this channel does. Let's start with things physicists are good at. You might think of physicists as people who deal with atoms, particle accelerators, or telescopes. So it would be reasonable for you to be asking yourself, why do I need this? Especially if you have no plans to build a particle accelerator in your backyard. But physicists have skills beyond trapping atoms and calculating Feynman diagrams. I'm going to focus on two of these. Quantifying uncertainty and making useful approximations. Let's start with quantifying uncertainty. When one thinks of using physics knowledge, they might think of applying the laws of nature to predict what will happen in certain physical scenarios. But we can also do the reverse. In physics research, we make hypotheses and test them in experiments. From the results of these experiments, we attempt to discover new laws of nature. Okay, we want to take the results of experiments and use those results to draw conclusions about the laws of nature. But there's a significant complication. Those experimental results have uncertainties. So this forces us to draw conclusions in the face of uncertainty. When we report a scientific result, we don't just say that we are pretty sure or very sure of a conclusion that we draw. If we measure a physical quantity, we quote an error bar. If we believe we've discovered a new particle, we state how strong the evidence for that discovery is. And if we rule out some specific hypothesis, we state how much it's ruled out by. In all cases, we need to report both our conclusion and how certain we are of it. There are statistical methods for quantifying just how sure we are of our conclusions. As physicists, we have to be reasonably adept at using these methods. Okay, let's look at the next thing that physicists are good at, making useful approximations. We'll start by mentioning a basic assumption that goes into physics research. The laws of nature, as we know them, are almost certainly wrong. The laws as currently written are approximations to deeper laws that we just haven't discovered yet. They are excellent approximations to reality for the range of situations under which they have been tested so far. Let's look at a possibly familiar example. Newton's laws were once thought to be true. They're not, by the way. So, if they're not true, why did people believe that they were? Newton's laws held, to a very good approximation, in the range of conditions under which they were tested. Eventually, they were tested with sufficient precision to be shown to be not absolutely true. 
Our current ideas about how the universe works will almost certainly suffer the same fate. If you'd like more details on this, check out the video The Standard Model is Probably a Spherical Cow, available on this channel. So, we work under the basic assumption that our current ideas are mere approximations to reality. If a hypothesis passes an experimental test, that doesn't tell us that hypothesis is true. It tells us that the hypothesis is a good approximation to reality for that experimental precision under those experimental conditions. The experimental precision tells us just how good an approximation it has to be. If we later do a more precise experiment, that approximation may well fail. If that happens, we need to find a new hypothesis to replace the old one. One question one could then ask is, what happens to the old, disproven ideas? When a long-standing hypothesis is disproven, it is still often approximately valid in the range of scenarios where it was previously tested. And also, it may be easier to use than the more correct theory that replaced it. While Newton's laws of motion are not absolutely correct, they are an excellent approximation to reality in everyday scenarios. So, we still use them, even though they're wrong. More generally, to solve hard problems, it is often useful to make simplified models and approximations. In doing so, it is important to understand that one is using an approximation, know how good the approximation is, and know when that approximation is good enough for the case at hand. To illustrate this last point, let's say you need to calculate some quantity and you're going to use an approximate relation to do so. In doing this, do you need the result to be correct to 10%, 1%, 1/1000th one one of a percent? Whatever the answer is, you need to make sure that the approximation you're using is good enough for the precision you need. More generally, you need to know under what experimental conditions and for what experimental precisions it is okay to use a specific approximation. For more information, you might want to check out the video Spherical Cows. Okay, so we talked about some skills that are important for physicists to have. Now let's talk about how these same skills can be useful to non-physicists. I'm going to talk about three ways in which these skills are useful more generally. They are understanding scientific results, demanding better science communication, and uses in everyday life. Let's start with understanding scientific results. In April of 2021, the Fermilab Muon G-2 collaboration reported a measurement of a quantity called G-2 of the Muon. Their measurement disagreed with the standard model prediction by 4.2 sigma. There are lots of questions one could ask upon hearing this information. Like, what does this result mean? How large is the disagreement? Or, is the standard model ruled out? Does this mean some other hypothesis is right? If we want to understand the muon G-2 result, we need to understand the uncertainties on both the experimental result 
and the standard model prediction. We won't get into the details here, but if you're interested, check out the playlist mini-series on G-2 of the muon. Uncertainties on experimental results have precise mathematical meanings. Error bars have specific meanings, although you have to be careful that you know which definition is being used for a specific result. Confidence levels also have specific meanings. Knowing how these quantities are defined is necessary for correctly interpreting scientific results. Also, often it might appear that two different experimental results disagree. But experimental results have error bars. The tools discussed on this channel give the basic techniques for figuring out if two results really substantially disagree, and if so, by how much. So it might not be realistic to expect the general public to understand supersymmetry or polymerase chain reaction. But it is feasible to be able to tell how certain scientists are of their own results. These tools can give you a fighting chance of being able to figure that out. These tools are also important for understanding the progress of science, so how old ideas are replaced with newer, better ones. Let's suppose we have some scientific hypothesis. Many experiments have been done to test this hypothesis, and they have all agreed with its predictions. Then, one day, an experiment is done that gives a result that appears to disagree with the predictions of the hypothesis. Does this mean we're witnessing a revolution in science? And how do we know? Answering these questions requires understanding the conditions under which the experiments were conducted and their measurement uncertainties. Otherwise, we cannot evaluate whether or not the experiments actually disagree with each other or with the hypothesis. If you'd like more information, you can check out the aforementioned video, The Standard Model is Probably a Spherical Cow as well as the videos Science as an Iterative Approximation to Nature and Elon Musk said something important, be less wrong over time. Okay, next, demanding better science communication. Understanding of uncertainties is critical for interpreting scientific results, but science as presented to the public tends to give only conclusions and gloss over how they were reached or how certain they are. This is not optimal. The subtleties of experimental details and error bars are unfortunately typically lost on the press. These details will be made available to other scientists. So while the media might ignore these details, they typically do exist. Even when information is from scientists, the emphasis is often more on things like getting the next generation interested in STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, than on communicating the actual scientific results. We should change this. With a better understanding of measurement uncertainties, the public and the media can better know what questions to ask. This also makes it easier for scientists to give more complete information. Okay, next, real life uses. In real life, we have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. It is useful to be able to quantify this uncertainty. Also, approximations are everywhere. 
it is useful to recognize that they are approximations and know when they are valid. We also find ourselves needing to evaluate claims. If someone claims that a certain lifestyle change reduces the probability of a certain health ailment, or if they claim that a certain local law reduces the instances of a particular type of crime, does their argument hang together? Okay, with that, let's briefly talk about what this channel does. It has three basic themes. The first is science and scientific methods. We cover some scientific results, especially from particle physics. When we do, there tend to be more nuts and bolts included than would be found in most other places. We also pay a lot of attention to how uncertainty is expressed in scientific results. More generally, we also look at the methods of science and how science progresses with time. The second theme on this channel is statistics. We cover the important distributions like the Poisson distribution, the Gaussian distribution, etc. And we also look at the conditions under which they arise. We also look at hypothesis testing, statistical significance, p-values, etc. And lastly, we pay special attention to interpreting statements made with these quantities. Lastly, we look at real-life applications. We look at how to make sense of reported scientific results, using statistical methods to draw conclusions about the world around us, and making approximations in problem solving. The videos on this channel are color-coded by theme. Introductory videos like this one have a blue background. Videos on science and scientific methods have a salmon-colored background. Those on statistics have a purple background. And lastly, videos with real-world examples have a green background. Well, that concludes this introductory video to Think Like a Physicist. Feel free to leave comments and questions below. Thanks.